everybody, I'm Mercedes, and today I'm going to be trying to make some watercolor paint with rose petals with my partner Maddie, who lives with me. Hi, I am a graduate student at the University of Wyoming. I study communication disorders and speech language pathology, and while I'm familiar with the scientific process and the science related to my field, I'm not very well versed in physical sciences like chemistry, which this is going to involve a lot of. So I'll be learning along with you guys today. Yeah. So if you haven't met me before, I'm a senior at the University of Wyoming studying microbiology and physiology. And so I also have this passion for art that I love to interplay with science. I love finding things that combine both art and science because I think that those two have so much to offer one another and they just make things possible that wouldn't have been possible before. So before we get started, let's go over our materials. We have our lovely roses, right? Um, I decided to go with yellow and red. They're just different enough that there might be a difference in how it sticks to the paper. Uh, we have our gum arabic, which is just a fibrous compound that is also supposed to help stick to the paper, according to our prior research that we have done before this. We have our scissors. We have our coffee filters and tea strainer. Either of these will work. We have our cutting board, some bowls to keep the paint in, on our pots that are just deep enough to hold some water. And at the end, we will try and test it on both regular printer paper and cold pressed watercolor paper. And so, oh, one more material, the most important one. Yep. My lab notebook. So my lab notebook has our experimental design for today, and so let's jump into that. Okay, so after watching Rachel's writing a lab notebook with Rachel video, I decided also to create my own virtual roadshow lab notebook. And so I went through, watched her video, added things that she told me to add, like a sign out page, table of abbreviations, table of contents and a preface and if you haven't checked out that video I really encourage you to go check it out it's just a great resource for lab notebook record keeping and just be, how to be a good scientist and record your data correctly so the first entry that I have in here is my making paint from rose petals made sure to date my page and then for the first thing I have here I have my hypothesis relevant literature, benefits, and safety. My hypothesis, I am guessing that oven dried petals and water plus gum arabic will make the most saturated pigment. And I'm saying this because of something that I read, which I've listed here. It was how to make your own watercolor paint from artistsandillustrators.co.uk. And the benefits from this are that the paint is naturally sourced from eco-friendly materials. And it's important to note that we need to use oven mitts to take out the drying petals to prevent burns. So let's hop into the experimental plan. First for our materials, just in narrative form all throughout this, very important to keep it in narrative form. I list my materials, say that I need dozen roses each color. I have my pot, tea strainers and coffee filters, scissors, baking sheet, and oven are ready to go. And then I already ordered the gum arabic online. My experimental variables, I just went ahead and outlined each of the groups that I'm planning on doing. So just petals with fresh petals, and then fresh petals with gum arabic, and then oven dried petals, and then oven dried petals with gum arabic. So in order to prepare the dried petals, I will start by cutting off the stems and only leaving the head of the flowers. I will do this with two rose heads of each color. Then I will heat my oven to 170 degrees Fahrenheit, which is the lowest setting possible on my oven. And 150 to 200 degrees Fahrenheit is preferable for this. I rotate the rose heads every 30 minutes until they are completely dry and this is expected to take about one and a half to two and a half hours. Then we go on to making the paint. So first we pull out the petals of the roses and organize them by colors. Then we'll pull apart the petals and tear them up by using scissors. A food processor, a blender might be helpful here but I'm not sure that it'll be necessary. When we, put the metal, when we put the petal pieces into a large pot, one of each color, we have to separate them by color, 
and we'll have to have them have enough water to cover the petals and bring it to a simmer for about one and a half hours or until the petals begin to lose their color. Then we will use a tea strainer or a coffee filter to separate the petals from the water. And after this, if gum arabic is required, we will add one part gum arabic for every four parts water. The water should be slowly added to the gum arabic and mixed in until the desired consistency is achieved. Solutions of gum arabic and water can be stored in a cool place for later use. And then to test the paint out, after separating the different petal paint mixtures into different containers, I will test out each pigment on regular printer paper and on cold pressed watercolor paper. So now that we're ready to start going, we have to record some observations. So I just listed my first one, an example. You can also put this in a table form. I chose to go with just kind of a bulleted form because I didn't know what type of table would benefit me the most, but if you can come up with a table that would work for you, that would be great. So now we've talked about the technical stuff, the record keeping, let's jump into the experiment. Okay, so first let's each take one yellow and one red rose. Okay, and we're going to cut the stem off and we're going to cut it to about right here. See how there's kind of a fat part of the rose? We're going to go right below the fat part of the rose. And I think it might be kind of fun to just see if we can do anything with the leaves. What do you think? Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Throw some on there for yeah. fun. But. So I have the oven heating up to 170 degrees, and that's just because that's as low as our oven goes to. <laughs> and so um, we're going to check on these every 30 minutes, and we're going to rotate them every 30 minutes. Um, and let's just give a little quick look to the camera. This is what's going to go in. Okay, so I think we're ready here. The leaves only took 30 minutes, and then I had to take them out because they were nice and dry. But now we're ready for the roses. Even though my oven was on the lowest setting, I'm still using my hot, hot pads because safety first, safety last, safety always. That's what Rachel always likes to say. Okay, so come on over here, and this is just kind of what they look like after they've been drying. And we dried them, it ended up being an hour and a half that we dried them. Okay, so now that we have these dry flowers, let's take off the petals and put them into the bowl, separating them by color. Maybe you could mix them too. That'd be actually kind of cool. If anybody tries this at home, they should try that and let me know how it goes. The inside of our roses are not quite dry, so maybe should have um, kept them in there for another 30 minutes, and we can maybe even pop these back in the mm -hmm. oven. Um, but that's just how experimenting goes. You just kind of you just go with the flow. And sometimes when you go to do an experiment and you have all of these questions that you want answered, you come out of it and you have more questions than what you started with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But sometimes that's also what makes science fun. Because you never know what you're going to learn. We'll just kind of lay those out so they're nice and open. Alright, back in the oven we go. Slightly touch. Flowers themselves are not hot, but just always want to be very, very careful. They seem good. Okay, let's go crush them. Okay, so now what we're doing here is just ripping up the petals, just tearing them up. You can use scissors, your fingers, or anything really. Ideally, we would have like a mortar and pedestal type situation, but I don't have one of those at home. <laughs> so sometimes you just gotta get creative. You could also use a food processor or a blender. You could, the dried ones are especially easy, they're just kind of crunch though. So. 
sometimes there are a lot of extraneous or um, confounding variables, which are variables that you don't expect there to be. And that's sometimes why science can cause more questions, <laughs> I think, a big part of why at least. Sometimes if you don't find them while you're doing an experiment, it can change the result because you don't know whether they were impacting it or what you were doing mm -hmm. and planning was what changed the outcome. That's also why repeatability is so huge, right? Because if we know that more than one person has done it, it's more likely that they were correct in what they did and there were less likely to be confounding variables. All right, so we have mashed and mashed and mashed, and here's what we've come up with for the red. Looks pretty good, pretty small. Even better for the green, yep. But our yellow is giving us a little bit of trouble, so I think we should maybe try to throw it in a blender here. Yes, this is seeming to be much better, much better method. <laughs> Let's look at that. Yes. Okay. So, lesson learned. If it's difficult, use the blender. <laughs> I bet you could get it that small. It would just take a lot of patience if you didn't have a blender. So, it's doable. It's just we got lazy. <laughs> okay. So, now we're ready for our fresh flowers here. Gonna do the same thing that we did with our dry flowers to reach here. Try and pick bigger ones just because more paint. just below that little bulby part, the big fat part in the stem. Right below there. And I guess I'll keep some leaves from these guys too. This is actually, I think, a really cool way of finding different paints because it's natural. It's all natural, right? A lot of our pigments that we have in our everyday lives come from um, man-made chemicals and things like that. And so it's just really cool that these are so eco-friendly and literally green. <laughs> you don't have to laugh at me jokes if you don't want to. I can't see you. All right, now that I have all my flower heads done, I'll have Maddie come over and help me. And we're just gonna take off the petals. Does she love me? Does she love me now? <laughs> I used to do that on the playground all the time oh, when yeah, I was a kid. Too. Me too. Any flower with petals, man. Yeah. Poor flowers, man. I mean, we're not being very nice to them right now, but. They're going to serve an artistic purpose. Yes. Hopefully. Yeah, I know. Assuming this works. I don't know. When I was crushing the dried pigment, at least, the pigment was getting on my fingers. Mm -hmm. And so that was a little encouraging. Yeah, I noticed that the most with the red. I didn't see very much with the yellow. That just might be because it's so close to... Yeah. Like, it's not as much of a contrasting color. Interesting. Yeah. To your skin. Yeah. Do we just get rid of the bottoms when we're done? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. Yep, all of our pigment that we want is up in the actual petals. If you included those parts, that might actually be one of those confounding variables mm. that I talked about because those have other pigments, right? These are really rich, concentrated red pigment, but um, in the center, maybe there's yellow for pollen or green for the stem. Just not quite as good and pigmented as the petals themselves. Right. Because of what happened with the yellow flowers, we think it would be better to use the blender for all of the fresh flowers. I don't think these are going to mash as well. It would take a lot of time. So we're going to use the blender, but to make sure we're not putting any of those confounding variables in there, we're going to rinse it out so we have all of the dry petals out before we start with the fresh ones. 
and we'll have to dry it off with a washcloth. You can just use this one. And we'll do that to make sure the pigments also don't mix between each of the flowers because we're going to have to use the blender for all three of the colors. I have to rinse off the lid too, can't forget that. Yeah, can't forget the lid. Make sure you're getting it good in all the crevices. Our blender is nice because the top actually comes out so I can make sure all of those petals and the little last bits get washed away. Huh. We are cleaning out the red roses and the water is purple. Bright purple. Very purple. That's interesting. Hmm. Well, I guess we'll have to see if we have red or purple paint at the end of this. Hmm. Now we get to add the leaves in. These are all really fresh leaves so we can see the contrast between them yeah. and the dry leaves. And it's important to know too, just be kind of aware if you're using a blender or something that you're putting food in later, really make sure to look and see that the roses that you're using or the flowers that you're using are safe to eat and that you are really, really clean and conscious about that in the kitchen. Yeah. Safety first, safety last, safety always. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> How gorgeous that is. Just so beautiful. Here's the dry. And we have the wet. These actually are a little bit different in colors and shade. If you look really closely, like see the green here and the fresh. It looks a little bit lighter when it's dry. And, but it's weird because I think that the red is the opposite. This looks a little bit darker than the fresh to me. So it's kind of interesting to play with the different colors and just see how wet and dry affects them each. All right, so now we're gonna take each of the dry petals here. And we have three different pots. They're going to go all in each one of them, so one per pot. So we're going to make sure we remember that like the yellow went in this, so we'll put the yellow fresh flowers in that one, and we'll remember that the leaves went inside here, so we'll put the fresh leaves in there, and same thing with the red. Just that way we can minimize any extraneous things, any confounding variables or extra stuff that we don't want to have to worry about. Okay, so now I'm gonna get some water and Maddie's got some bottled water that she's bringing over here. Just gonna pour it over and we're gonna get it so it's just going right over top of the petals. Just enough. All right, what do you say? That's like half inch of water maybe? Half inch water, half it was a cup. A cup of water for a head of a rose, two heads of roses. Okay, so okay. we're gonna do the same for each of these. All right, so these have been on for about 15 minutes and stir in. See how some of those petals are starting to turn kind of white? All that pigment's going into the water just like how we want it. Try and get some of this pigment that's on my spoon. Oh, just to get more off. Okay, that's pretty good. All right, check on my other guys here. I'm using the same spoon to stir each one so I don't cross-contaminate the colors here. Yellow is kind of hard to see in a black pan. <laughs> I wonder how this is gonna come out. all the pigment off of there that I can. You can see how they're just there's just barely bubbles going. Just barely tiny bubbles. That's what you want. Baby baby bubbles. Alright, so there are these leaves. And then I'll check back in in another 15 to stir until the end. 
All right, so it's been 45 minutes. So I'm going to turn off the heat. Uh, 30 minutes to cool here. This is how stuff is looking. So now we have let these cool for about 30 minutes and so they're no longer hot. Now we're going to take them and filter them into their respective containers again. So let's look and see which container did which here. I'm going to just kind of shake it around to get all the juices and just pour it through the filter. Get as much as I can in there, shake it off. All right, and now I just lift it up. And this might take a minute for all of the water and goodness to kind of drain out of here. And you can even encourage it by squeezing it. So maybe we'll do that here in a second. I'll start getting the others. This one's the one I'm most excited about, the red pink we got going on here. Oh, look at that gorge. It's almost like, like cranberry juice. Getting a little shaky shaky here. Okay. Same thing, lift it up. Usually there's a little bit of an initial spillage. I'm gonna squeeze that here in a sec and do the leaves. very much at all. Interesting. Hmm. I think it's because the particles are smaller, smallest in the leaves. Okay, so now I have some clean spoons here. And we're gonna just kind of squish. Get all that liquid out of there. That we can. Okay, set some of those lids. Oh, I almost cross contaminated. That wasn't very good. I'm gonna use a different spoon. Same idea here. The juice we can. Okay. Let's see if we can get anything out of this one. The rose, the red one definitely died the coffee filter. Yeah, you're right. That's exciting. bit something very slightly oh see that burst you have to use the tea filter I have to use the tea filter with this one yeah I guess I'll get out what I can and try the tea filter again all right so got a little itty bitty tiny bit of our leaves as you can see and i just went ahead and put lids on these so there's no evaporation we don't lose any of our paint but now i'm going to do the same thing we did with the dry leaves with the fresh ones
All right, and then last time we had to add a half cup of water kind of at the 30 minute mark for each thing. And so we're gonna do a cup in each of the rose heads and half a cup in the leaves still, but at the 30 minute mark, we're gonna add a half a cup to all of them so they don't dry out too fast. But let's grab some bottled water. And measure this out. How convenient that this is so high up. More perfect at a half cup, look at that. We decided to use filtered water just because it doesn't have quite as many potential like minerals or things that might be in tap water that could be confounding variables. glass has a conversion and apparently eight ounces is equivalent to a cup. I'm sure many of you knew this. I just am relearning this again for probably the sixth time or so in my life. simmering and put a timer on for an hour and 15 minutes and check in every 15. I'm checking in here a little bit past the 15 minute mark and we're already seeing some differences in the tone of pink and the yellow and even in the leaves. There's some definite differences. How exciting! Alright, 30 minutes to cool. This is what they look like. Looking good. All right, so now we're ready to filter our fresh flowers into our respective containers, making sure know which one goes where. Good thing for labels. <laughs> Yeah, this is different. Okay, so these are the two yellows. This is dry and this is fresh, right? So already I'm noticing some differences. The dry looks a little bit more green in the green and the fresh looks a little bit more yellow. And then with the dry red, this looks, I don't know, I wanna say a little bit lighter color um, than the fresh flowers. The fresh flowers gave this like cranberry really dark red and then the yellow it looks like maybe the fresh flowers are slightly more opaque but similar shades of yellow at this point so now let's go on with the rest of our experiment okay so now we're ready to try and put in the gum arabic for one of them so i'm going to do a half a teaspoon of gum arabic in each of these and it's powdery difficult to get it all the way. I'm trying to get it so it is filling up the cup, filling up the spoon as much as possible. Okay. 
I don't know if it matters if we mix it right away, but maybe we should do some mixing here. Oh, it's kind of sticky. Interesting, okay. Never worked with gum Arabic before. So I think we're ready to start testing. So I have cold pressed watercolor paper and printer paper and we're going to start doing some swatches. Okay, so I guess I'll start with the dry with no gum thick in it. Oh wow. Yeah, it's still pigment and sticking to this paper. <laughs> Hear my dog. He's excited. Okay. So let's try this. I'm going to get a little less water, a little less paint, because I know that printer paper is easily saturated. Here, oh, that's pretty. That's really pretty, huh? Yeah, we can come back a little bit back here, saturate a little bit. Okay, so let's try it with some gum Arabic in it now. Okay, maybe sticking a tiny bit better. It looks like a different color to me. Yeah, it's also not the same color. Very different color on printer paper too. Interesting, I didn't really expect gum Arabic to change the color all that much. Now we're gonna do the fresh without. Oh, that's gorgeous. Wow. Wow, okay, that's wow. That's amazing. might have found our winner here. Oh, all right. Well, that's what it looks like, I guess. <laughs> yeah, I think that one's the winner that's right there. That's beautiful. Let's see what it looks like with the gum Arabic, see if it's even better, maybe. Sometimes you don't even need to add things and you just add things and it messes it up, but let's see what what's going on here. Hmm. That's really light. different color like peachy almost yeah it's kind of coral -y. like it lightened it hmm. okay so we did the same thing this time we took half a teaspoon gum arabic added it to two teaspoons of the pigment and now we're testing out the dry with out gum arabic for the yellow hmm it's kind of a dark yellow yeah printer paper. Oh. it's not it's even subtle. showing up on the printer paper okay so now we'll try the dry with gum arabic That is much lighter. Hmm. It looks like the same tone though. Mm, it's probably gonna be very light on the printer paper, yep. Yep, can't really see it on the, well, I can see it a little more on the printer paper. Okay. Maybe just because it's brighter? I don't know, maybe. All right, let's try the fresh. This looked a lot more vibrant to me when it was in the, the pot, so. Let's see what we can get here. Hmm. A little more. There's nothing. Oh, there's a little something. That's a much brighter, more sunshiny yellow. Yeah, it is. I'm cheerful. 
We're not doing so good on the printer paper though, huh? No, the yellow's really not showing up. Yeah. So like if you have cool the watercolor paper it will, but if you don't, mm, not doing so good. That red really did show up on both though. So this is with the gum. It's much more translucent. Yeah, I'm even trying to like build it up a little bit and it's very difficult. Okay. Yep. All right, so now let's do the final one, the leaves. See how these guys did. Hmm, looks more yellow than green to me, but it did show up. I think it's showing up a little better than the yellow did. Yeah, I think so too. It's just like a different yellow. Let's see here. Yeah, I think that's maybe a tad more green. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think a little bit. <laughs> And you really can't see. Interesting. That's lighter than the yellows were. Yeah. The yellows did show up eventually on the printer paper. Yeah. Once they dried. Let's see if the gum Arabic helps at all. Let's see. Mm, not so not much. really. Well, there you have it. I guess we'll wait until these dry to look and see how they actually are, but that's what we have for now. All right, so it's a few days later and this is what they look like dry. The yellow actually ended up turning out much more vibrantly than I initially saw it when it was wet. And they turned it out really beautiful, actually. I'm happy how they turned out. I also wanted to show you all how I ended up storing them. So I repurposed an old ice cube tray and I, you can kind of see how they're starting to, but eventually these will all dry out and then just like watercolor, you can rehydrate them and use them just like you would watercolor. And I have a little key here that helps me remember which types are what. And then I'll keep these swatches with it too so I can know what the colors look like. Another way that you could store these, if you, especially if you were doing just one color, is with a little dropper. That would work great too. But stay tuned for the next video where we go over our results and I start to paint a picture with the, using these paints.